Hello, and welcome to Cooking Through the Collection. My name is Melissa, and I'm a librarian and home cook. I do a lot of research when wanting to expand my repertoire of cooking, and so I've challenged myself to walk through the stacks of my library's cookbook collection and grab things I've never tried before. So let's see what I've selected this week. I had not planned what this episode's cookbook would be, so while I was researching Tech Mouse 44 on Instagram posted the following about the Aromas Ascend episode. Just listen to the episode, and I appreciate hearing someone else have the same response to trying a new cuisine for the first time. Thank you so much. As for the bay leaves, I think the flavor they add is almost a savory citrus brightness. That, that sounds about right. If you can find the book Spiced by America's Test Kitchen, they do a really good job of explaining different spices and the flavor profiles of different spices and how the preparation affects the flavor. Well, thank you, Tech Mouse. Of course, I had to immediately go to the library catalog, and my library had Spiced by America's Test Kitchen. America's Test Kitchen is really an amazing publisher, website company, and media mogul that really has been testing the recipes for decades. They are extremely in-depth with their research. Sometimes you might not be in the mood for an all-day recipe, but they've really delved down about every ingredient, best techniques, and so I knew it was going to be a good book walking in. So the full title is Spiced, Unlock the Power of Spices to Transform Your Cooking by America's Test Kitchen. And because they mentioned bay leaves, I just, tick mouse, I just, I have to go. So bay leaves, about page 11. Bay leaves are unique. Most recipes add bay leaves to the pot early on and leave them in for the duration of cooking so they infuse dishes with their flavor. There are two types, common Turkish bay leaves that come from bay or laurel trees and more aromatic California bay leaves that come from a shrubby evergreen. California bay leaves have a potent eucalyptus-like flavor, whereas Turkish bay leaves have a tea-like profile. So I think mine may be more of the California type. They're also really, were really big leaves. It doesn't say on the package, so unfortunately I can't answer that. So when, again, I was looking at the index, one of the recipes that came up was chipotle ketchup on page 216. So let's get in the kitchen and start cooking. So I am going to be making the chipotle ketchup from page 216 of Spiced. We're going to wash our hands as always. Important steps. And there's a lot of spices today. This is one of those recipes that might be a little bit more of an investment of money to have these spices. If you're one of those lucky people that lives near somewhere where you can get small amounts of things in a spice shop, you'll be all set. Luckily, I already had all of these things, so that worked out in my advantage. So it says, bundle the bay leaves, peppercorns, mustard seeds, cloves, cinnamon stick, and allspice in a cheesecloth and tie with kitchen twine to secure. Set aside. I could not find a cheesecloth, but I have these coffee filter bags, and that should work great, and I won't even need kitchen twine because it has a string. So we're going to start with two bay leaves. The ones I have are really large, so what I'm going to do is take a gigantic one and rip it in half and place it in the bag. And as you remember, we talked about bay leaves back in the Aromas of Sint episode. That's actually what inspired me to make this today. So get into the bag. We're going to close the container. One teaspoon of black peppercorns. The peppercorns I have are Kampot peppercorns. These are from the Spice House. It says, Kampot peppercorns from Cambodia are strictly certified Appalachian of origin products, much as champagnes are. The red ones have a jasmine-like sweetness and subtle heat, but the black peppercorns harvested earlier have a spicy richness and intense flavor. So let's give them a shot. It says one teaspoon of black peppercorns. So we're gonna take that and try not to spill them everywhere. So the next ingredient are yellow mustard seeds, which I have on hand for making other dishes. I don't remember what I got these for before. So a teaspoon of yellow mustard seeds. They're significantly smaller, so they're gonna make even more of a mess. So let's try not to do that. A teaspoon of whole cloves. So I have a bunch of cloves. 
Also Spice House. Again, not sponsored, but I really do love their products. Cloves, whole hand selected. Discovered in Indonesia's Spice Islands, cloves have long flavored the recipes of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, as well as present day baked goods everywhere. Slightly sweeter and more complex than the Indonesian variety, Sri Lankan cloves are hand-picked, yielding a plump, perfect shape, ideal for studding hams or oranges. I did grow up in a household that studs hams. So that is a thing. So it says a teaspoon of whole cloves. So right now it's been pretty straightforward measuring out equal amounts of everything. Come on, come on, the container. Obviously measuring cloves since they're a completely different shape. A little bit more challenging. Okay, one cinnamon stick broken. I have some of those left over again from the Aromas of Sin episode. Corinche salmon, cassia sticks. Cut and washed with thick quills, our true cassia sticks are grade double A. These four inch sticks are perfect cocktail length and great in punches or eggnog. If allowed to dry, the quills can be reused three or four times. So it says one stick broken in half. These are quite long. As I recall before, it broke easier than I recalled. But I'm still gonna take a thinner one and have a half chance. There we go. And then a quarter teaspoon of allspice berries. Now allspice is not all spices, it is one spice. I remember learning about that. Allspice berries, Jamaicans take great pride in their world famous allspice, harvested from 40 foot pimenta trees. So named because of its reminiscent of clove, cinnamon, and nutmeg all at once. Allspice lends a rich, warm flavor to barbecue sauces, jerk seasoning, gingerbread, and apple pie. Ooh. Gingerbread and apple pie sounds good. So a quarter teaspoon of allspice berries, so significantly less. These are bigger than peppercorns, so that's interesting. Pour them into the bag. Okay, so then we're gonna secure this cheesecloth, which will be pretty straightforward, though I can tell this is kind of a cheap bag, so I'm gonna go to not push too hard on it. Secure it shut, I will tie a knot. Okay, so we finished part one. Part two, heat a Dutch oven and oil over medium heat until simmering, add onion and cook until softened, stir in tomato paste and garlic and cook, scraping the bottom of the pot until fragrant. Okay, I am going to mince the cloves. I had one of those silicone garlic peeler things. I don't know where it is. I've never quite gotten it to work the way it's supposed to, but it kind of looks like a cannoli shell, but it's silicone and you're supposed to, let's try it. You place the clove inside and you roll it. You have to roll it more than you think you do. Hey, worked pretty well this time. Okay, so we're gonna do that. Place the next one in. Oh, that sounded like I might have broken it. Maybe there were two cloves on that one. Okay, that one didn't quite work the same way. There was one of those little side baby cloves. So let's put it back in. Roll it. I think that's supposed to use basically the tension between the silicone and the papery covering so that's the second one it works. It's, it's working so i have that little half clove i'll use that as well the peeling garlic is definitely not one of those fun things especially if you have to do large amounts of it okay we have peeled the garlic cloves so it said one onion chopped i have these gigantic white onions as i've mentioned before so we're going to cut it from root to stem end well yeah stem end and we're going to do a quick peel. Does anyone else sometimes have pieces of the skin just not want to let go and you have to take off too much of the onion? I'm not a fan of that. It does seem to happen, especially when the onions seem to be not of the best quality. So it just says chopped. So let's see if these onions today try to give me any grief on my eyes. I am having this feeling there will, but if I turn on my exhaust fan, I think you're not gonna be able to hear me. So we're gonna work with what we got. I apologize if you hear some outside noises. We're doing a yard cleanup. I didn't think about that when I was recording today. Okay, I am now feeling it in my eyes, but we're gonna keep going because it's not to the point where I can't see. Do goggles really work? I've never tried the goggle trick. You tag me on social media. My accounts are in the show notes. White onions are so large, so it's taking up most of my little cutting board, which I'm going to need again. So I'm going to be aware of that. This is one of those recipes that 
It's gonna have a lot of prep up front, but when it's done, it's gonna be a lot more simple. After making all of these <laughs> more intense recipes, especially the vegan baking Bible, which was three recipes in one, I am appreciating simplicity in my life. People are still raving about that passion fruit meringue pie. I made a second batch of the filling because I had all the ingredients, though I had to add a little bit of butter, so it's not vegan. I did warn everyone when I was making it again. So I'm gonna move the onions over to a plate. The term at culinary school when you're prepping all of your ingredients in advance was called mise en place, things in place, which I really, I really do appreciate that French term. So this is for the garlic, it needs to be minced, which is interesting since we're gonna be blending it, but I guess the recipe really wants it to release its flavor. But yeah, I, I love garlic, lots of things, aggressive garlic. I'll even eat small amounts of raw garlic. This obviously will not be raw, it's being cooked. But yeah, a lot of people don't know that ketchup has so many spices in it. Some people say ketchup may be bland, but it's, it's really not. And this ketchup, obviously, it's called chipotle ketchup, will have a kick. My husband loves a spicy ketchup. We actually can get some at our local farm. They make spicy ketchup using their really good summer tomatoes. And you're probably going, Melissa, is it summer in New Jersey? No, it's not. And you're probably going, why are you gonna do something with tons of tomatoes? Well, you can't just make things in season. So we're gonna do, not necessarily cheap, but you know, a well-known thing. Wash my hands again after all the onion and garlic. So I don't have that sticky residue. Dry the hands. Okay, this recipe is using a Dutch oven. Because we're using tomatoes, an enamel one is better. Clear the deck. We put it on the back burner, because as we've learned, the front burner is not quite powerful enough. Okay, so we have our garlic, we have our onion, we have our spice sachet. Heat oil in Dutch oven over medium heat until shimmering. So this is the back one. Medium heat on my stove is about five. One tablespoon of vegetable oil. So in my household, we use canola oil. I know that some people use safflower or peanut. We don't have peanut allergies, but I didn't grow up using it. We're gonna heat until shimmering which is interesting because I don't think of medium shimmering, but we're gonna do that. Add the onion and cook until softened, five to seven minutes. And we're gonna stir in the tomato paste. And the tomato paste is actually gonna be a whole six ounce can of tomato paste. Tomato paste has a very concentrated tomato flavor and it's a great way to add tomato flavor or something without really watering it down. And the cool thing is about most cans of tomato sauce, you can actually use a can opener, open the top, you can, depending on the type of can, if the lip on the bottom is the same on the top and doesn't have those rounded edges, you can actually open both sides, take the lid off one end and actually push it through like the tube. And then you don't have to worry about scooping it all out. That has been a very helpful trick. I, I probably learned that on Food Network. So we're just waiting for the oil. I'm gonna want a wooden spoon. Got some very nice wooden spoons for Christmas from my spouse. Husband knows his wife. So we're gonna wait for the oil to heat up. So I think we have some shimmering. So let's throw in some onion. This is obviously we don't want this super, super hot, but we do want some heat so we get a sizzle. So we're gonna put in all of the onions as it says. Maybe I should have put the temperature up a little bit more, but sometimes I'm impatient in cooking and that's not always a good trait. So it says we're gonna cook until softened five to seven minutes. So we'll be back soon. It was really interesting to see in this recipe how many spices go into ketchup. One of my favorite spices actually in baking and is important to this recipe are cloves. So I wanted to read the section on that on page 12. Pungent peppery cloves are the dried unopened buds of an Indonesian tree. They resemble nails. In fact, the word clove comes from the Latin word for nail, clavus. Brown cloves are quite pungent, potent, and peppery. Say that three times fast. So we more frequently call for whole cloves for grinding into blends of other spices of our infusing broths and condiments. However, jars of the assertive ground spice make a statement in baked goods like spicy molasses spice cookies. I can tell you that in my family, they were definitely a major ingredient in baked ham. My father would stud with cloves, put powdered mustard all over the ham. And then, of course, pineapple slices and cherries. You know, th this was the 80s. Let's, let's be real. It had a look. It was probably a 70s recipe, but I came across it when I was a kid. And I can definitely tell that flavor. So, yeah, one of my favorite spices. 
and I'm back. And we've gotten these until they have softened. So then we're gonna add the tomato paste and garlic. And as I had said before, if you cut both ends of the tomato paste can, the six ounce cans, I don't know if the bigger ones work, kind of take that first lid off and push on the bottom and push it through the can and actually just kind of comes out. I'm trying to figure out what to describe it. I'm old, so I would say maybe like the frozen juice concentrate where it just keeps the shape of the can. It works really well. And then it says also to add the garlic. So I'm going to add the garlic. And it says stir in the tomato paste and garlic and cook, scraping the bottom of the pot until fragrant around one minute. So we're gonna break up the tomato paste, mix it into the onion. That's gonna help it actually break down a little bit and kind of separate from itself. One of the things I've learned about, which I didn't know growing up and my mom did not do, I'm pretty sure again, I learned from cooking shows is browning tomato paste helps take out some of its acidity and adds another dimension of flavor almost kind of a roast tomato kind of vibe so this is definitely a step you do not want to skip make a difference it's just an extra minute you can actually kind of smell it get toasty you also don't want to brown garlic too long because it will burn i think because the tomato paste is in there will have a little bit more time i usually don't brown garlic by itself for longer than 30 seconds because i've had burning issues but it says scrape the bottom because things will stick to the bottom and those can be very tasty bits i know for some of the recipes at culinary school they called that a fond that bottom bit and you want those bottom bits with a wooden spoon i don't have to worry about damaging my pot as again i said i'm using an enamel cast iron so i can be a little bit more careful about that we've almost been a minute i don't have one of those fancy vitamix blenders i just have old style oster blender it is a glass jar, you know, not base, part. And what I've learned is because of my food allergies, it's a lot easier to clean this. It doesn't get etched over time, making sure the blade's properly in it and the gasket. <laughs> I have a story about that. We were having cooking classes in home ec in middle school and it was milkshake class. And I had trusted my co-students on my team to properly assemble the blender well the milkshake went everywhere what i learned is they had assembled the gasket and the blade in backwards into the blender i can tell you that does not work don't do that it explodes everywhere you need that rubber gasket to make sure you have a seal so it says we're going to transfer this mixture to the blender so we're going to carefully turn the burner off for now i know we're going to be using it again and then i'm going to carefully place this this is extremely hot so that's also kind of a scary thing in a blender. Get as much of this in here because the onion is going to be getting blended, obviously, so we don't want chunks. I'm probably going to have a piece, but we're going to put it through a strainer, and I hope that will get any errant bits away. I kind of have a spoon that's got a little bit of a scoopy edge, which is working for this. Otherwise, I think you would probably need more of a spatula to get the pieces off. This pan, Dutch ovens are so heavy, I can't just kind of tip it and scoop. So it says add the chipotle. It's two tablespoons of chipotle and adobo sauce. Chipotle is one of those really very intense but really lovely flavors. They are a pepper that's been smoked. I believe it's a jalapeno. I'll probably correct myself when I'm in my studio area. So this has a pull top lid. And then it's stored in what I believe is a tomato-based sauce, very flavorful, but it goes a very long way. This is why this is a spicy ketchup. So we need two tablespoons minced. I'm guessing that that's gonna be two to three. Yeah, I can already smell how hot these are. And I'm also worried about the heat. I'm not gonna try to pull, you can't really pull the seeds out of chipotles because they're just so wet and it's gonna of course be everywhere. So I'm going to carefully wash my hands. So it was about two of the larger size chilies in the can. I am going to very carefully get under my fingernails and everything because I did have to pick them out. Maybe I should have used the fork. And also it always comes in a can where you're going to need lots of it over time. You definitely don't want to keep it stored in the can. You should never do that with any object. So it says half of the tomatoes. As I said, we are not in summer. Tomatoes off season are gross. The story is my parents said because I grew up in the garden state that I actually would not eat off season tomatoes at all. So our solution is to use canned tomatoes. I'm using whole peeled tomatoes because they're the least processed. Honestly, if you need to do a cheat of this, 
I'm sure a smaller cut will be fine. That will save you a lot of time. But I'm using the two cans. So I'm opening one can now. And it says they should be cored and chopped coarse, which is interesting because that means I could have used the smaller amounts. I'm gonna cut them into quarters and place them in the blender. This blender is going to be extremely full. So this is why I can tell it's telling us to do this in smaller batches. I may not even put them all in. The peeled tomatoes are already going to be nice and flavorful because they've been picked at the height of season and steam packed. This is a good off season solution. My husband has made regular ketchup out of cherry tomatoes in a slow cooker and it's absolutely delicious. But we got a few more months until that's going to be an option for us. I love tomato season in New Jersey. Corn and tomatoes. I make a corn and tomato salad. Very simple and straightforward and it's absolutely wonderful. When I make tomato sauce, I also will use these whole peeled tomatoes because again, they've been the least processed. I really love Tutoroso tomatoes in the purple can for that kind of thing, but I didn't want anything with spices. So I just got whole peeled tomatoes from a brand that we all know. I didn't get the store brand. I'm putting all the liquid in too, because obviously that's an important part as well. I also have some of the extra juice from the cutting board. So I'm gonna pour that in and not waste it and also not have it all over my counter. We're gonna process into smooth about 30 seconds. Well, most of this is not thermally hot. I would consider this mostly hot. When you're closing a blender and you have a hot item, you do not want to have the lid completely shut off. Like if you have the center hole for pouring in, you want to have that open so you have a chance of letting the steam out because it will explode and then you will get burned. I'm gonna run this for about 30 seconds. I might have to run it a little bit longer. I'm gonna start on low and work my way up. And for mine, it's not a dial, it's buttons. So here we go. Actually gonna do some pulsing because the top part is not really blending. So revving my engine. So that's well blended. And I used a paper towel on top because I knew it was gonna come out. Transfer to the bowl. So that's just half the tomatoes. I'm going to take my strainer. It's a fine mesh one. I use it for straining lots of different things and rinsing grapes and stuff because it doesn't have large holes. So I'm gonna take the blender off the base. We're gonna scrape off as much as we can. And then I'm gonna pour all the stuff that I worked at into the strainer and kind of scrape the bits I can. I'm gonna put that back onto the blender, make sure it locks. Cause again, blender misassembled, bad things happen. So then we're gonna blend the other batch of the tomatoes and we will be right back. So I am back. I'm going to put the rest of the tomatoes into my strainer. If you have a small strainer, you might need to wait and do this part. Mine's pretty large. I think everything's gonna fit. I'm gonna pour all that out into my strainer. So this is where they said there's a bit of a challenge. Working in batches, see, I should have probably not put it all in. See, read ahead, didn't read ahead. Working in batches, strain puree through fine mesh strainer set over now empty pot, pressing firmly on solids with ladle to extract as much tomato pulp as possible. And then we're gonna discard the solids. Because we're trying to get out all of the skin, because we want like a smooth ketchup. Chunky ketchup's not bad, but it's not what people expect. I'm actually not using a ladle. I'm using my big wooden spoon and I'm pressing the liquid through the strainer kind of around the sides. And I can see it actually coming through. And this is going to take some time. This is patience. The other thing you can do is if you're kind of, yeah, pressing it against the sides, you're going to have to really rinse this strainer off when you're done because there's going to be a lot embedded in it. I would use the hose handle on your sink if you have it because you do not want this drying because it will not easily come out. Also, another tip. Remember how I mentioned you don't want to leave the chipotles in the can in the fridge? If you're worried about staining your plasticware, you can actually spray it with some neutral oil, like a canola spray, and then put it in. That will help with the staining a little bit. You can also take the chipotles and you can either chop them up a little bit in halves or freeze them whole. And then you can just have them and then pull out what you need. I do that with tomato paste when I buy a container. I measure it out in tablespoon amounts because that's usually closer to the volume that I use in a recipe. If you don't use tomato paste a lot, that's a really good plan. Otherwise, I would get the tubes and get a good Italian brand of the paste in the tube. So I picked up the strainer now with its handle. We're now into more of the solids, so you should use a little bit more pressure as the recipe suggested, because now you're pushing through, getting more of the tension of the solids. Since there's no skins on this, this is why you would want to get as much of the skins 
that you can. Luckily these tomatoes were already peeled. If you're using fresh ones, there's definitely gonna be more pulp in your strainer. And what I do is I get a separate clean spatula or spoon and I scrape the outside of the strainer. So the stuff that's been pushed through because sometimes you can't just get that off and it's still perfectly good stuff because it's gone through the strainer. And I scrape around the base to get that last bit because you are going to lose some volume. And then you take your strainer quickly over to your trash can to try and not spill everywhere. When I was pouring the second batch of tomatoes into the blender, I did have a situation and scrape out as much of the tomato solids that you can. So then we're going to follow the next step. Stir in vinegar, sugar, salt, and the spice sachet. So three quarters of a cup of cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar really does make a difference here. You don't want to use distilled that's really strong. Pour in the apple cider vinegar. We always have containers of apple cider vinegar on hand because my husband uses it in his barbecue sauce. So we have the apple cider vinegar. A third of a cup packed dark brown sugar. I always have dark brown sugar in the house. I know that some people will find that contentious. They think the light brown is better for taste. I grew up with dark brown. I prefer it. This is a case where I don't think it's gonna make that much of a difference. This is also a case when it says packed, you need to pack it because it is much more dense than regular sugar because it does have the moisture from the molasses. It does measure differently. So when it says packed, definitely press it in to your measuring vessel. So we're gonna add the third of a cup of brown sugar packed. Then we're gonna do salt, which is one and a half teaspoons of salt, which is actually a half tablespoon, but we will measure out. As I've said in my household here, we use fine sea salt, but if it says kosher, you really need to follow that because the salts are different. But in this case, I think we're fine. So one and a half teaspoons. So let's mix that in and then put the sachet in. The brown sugar may take a bit to put in, but you wanna kind of break that up so it doesn't all clump in one side. I see that molasses color stirring in. Looks great. Ketchup is really a much more complex thing than people realize. I don't know if the equivalent ketchups in other countries are. I know in the Philippines they have banana ketchup. There's actually some really cool articles about the woman who invented it. There was a taste gained during World War II, but they don't have tomatoes there, so she found a way to make it with bananas. And I have never tried it. I am allergic, as I've mentioned before. So unfortunately, I never get to have the chance to do that. So we mix that in, we're going to add in that sachet that we made earlier, and I'm gonna to try to press it down so it's submerged. Go in. We're going to bring it to simmer on medium. I'm gonna put mine a little lower because with enamel cast iron, mine gets hot and it really retains the heat, which is one of the advantages of using the Dutch oven and cast iron. And we're gonna say, wow, until the mixture has thickened, darkened in color and reduced to about two cups. There's probably six cups in there. That's a huge reduction. But then, you know, ketchup is this kind of more thick thing. So we're gonna come back in about 30 minutes to an hour when it's reduced to two cups. So once we have this really thickened up, it's gonna continue thickened as it cools actually. We're gonna discard the spice sachet and let it cool slightly. As we said, Dutch ovens really keep their heat for a long time. And then we'll transfer it to an air container and refrigerate until chilled about one hour. Ketchup can be refrigerated for up to two months. With all the vinegar and sugar, things don't grow in it as well. So once we're all done that, we will come back and give it a taste. Now you're probably wondering, what potato is Melissa gonna put ketchup on? There are many types of fried potatoes, as we know. I, I love most of them, but I will choose one fried potato format. That is my favorite and definitely a conduit for ketchup for me. I know not everyone's a fan, but my husband and I really are. And that is the tater tot. Whether it's the Burger King breakfast hash browns, which really are just tater tot coins. You can find them in the freezer section by other brands. They are just crispy, yet they have texture, kind of fluffy on the inside, and just hold together when you're dipping into ketchup. And yeah, glorious thing. So you know what's coming next. So this is Chipotle spiced ketchup. I know that we've bought spicy ketchup before and right. you are a fan. Yes, I am a very big fan of spicy ketchup. So I'm looking forward to trying this. This made a lot of ketchup, so hopefully we like it. Yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure it's tasty. So let's... The first way we're gonna taste it is on an Impossible Burger. Yes, we're not vegetarians, but we decided to get Impossible Burgers this week because it's just a different change of pace. Okay, let me know what you think. Hmm. That's good. How spicy is it? 
Well, as we've discussed before, I have a spicier palate than you, so I could have definitely taken it up a notch or two, but it's definitely there. You can definitely taste the spice in there. It's okay. good. Okay, and then we're going to try it on our favorite fried potato product, no tater tots. tots. Tater tots. Put some of the ketchup on there. That's good. Let me get a second bite. So we have a sample size. The ketchup is full of flavor. It's got that tomato and that sweetness that you want out of a ketchup. Like I said, I think I could have used it a little bit spicier, but I like things spicy. So for me to something for something to register for me as spicy, I think it has to be really spicy. It's definitely there, but it's I could I could use a little bit more of it personally. I know that you may disagree, and this might be perfectly spicy for you. So it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell on the Impossible Burger for me. Right. I can tell that it's not just regular ketchup, so I definitely need to try it with the tot. I'm not lose the tot in the ketchup. Oh my word. <laughs> try not to. Okay. I've lost the tot. I've lost. Oh You're no, here. no, no! Way too much. Way too much. Let's try this again. These tots are falling apart. Oh, that definitely has a kick. It definitely has a kit. I know you probably want something super hot, but this is definitely, if I had made this hotter, I don't know if I could eat it. I understand. That's why whenever I say I could I could use it spicier, I also say that with the caveat knowing that I like things spicy and you like things less spicy. Okay, so this made a lot of ketchup. Are you looking forward to eating it or should I take some to my coworkers? So let's eat as much of this as possible. This is good ketchup. Okay, I also agree. So here are my final thoughts on Spiced Unlock the Power of Spices to Transform Your Cooking by America's Test Kitchen. Again, a beautiful cookbook. And actually, this cookbook in my library was a book endowment. So they thought it was such a great cookbook that someone has it in their name as in memory of. There are beautiful photos. Recipes are extremely detailed, but not so wordy that you're falling asleep. Straightforward, beautiful pictures. And it's really great to find ways to try spices that you may already have in your cabinet. Or if you're being adventuresome and you're walking through the grocery store, maybe there's something you want to try for the first time. If I was going to borrow it or buy it, I would definitely buy this. I have other America's Test Kitchen cookbooks. I do find them really as good resources. I also like that this one has recipes from around the world. So they use the spices in different ways. So you can give something a try, and whether it's a different type of cuisine or something you're familiar with, you just want to make a better recipe. Thank you for joining me on Cooking Through the Collection. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, leave comments and reviews on any of your favorite platforms. Again, thank you, Tech Mouse, for this recommendation. You can visit the website for more information at cookthecollectionpod.com. Follow me on Instagram or Facebook at cookthecollectionpod or on Twitter at cookcollectpod. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode and happy cooking.